invite you to pray with me. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they will be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. O God, by the light of your fire, instructor of the hearts of your faithful people, granted by that same spirit, we may be truly wise and never rejoice in that consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm delighted that even your Siri listens to me. <laughs> she, she doesn't understand the South African <laughs> <laughs> That was very rude, Margaret. <laughs> no, that she doesn't understand South African. She doesn't understand. <laughs> Maybe she's deaf. <laughs> I met a traveller from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, he mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Anyone recognize the poem? By whom? <laughs> Ozymandias by? Shelley. Shelley, yeah. Shelley, not Keats. So it's Percy Shelley's poem. And you may know from the movies, or if you're cleverer than I am, books of literature, that Percy Shelley used to hold informal competitions in his home between himself and his friends, who were also poets. And in one informal competition, they took as their inspiration a phrase from Diodorus Siculus. And as you haven't watched the Netflix series about them, because one doesn't exist yet, I can tell you that he was a Greek historian. Greek historian Diodorus Siculus wrote Biblothea Historica, which summarizes the world history of that time in about 40 books. Diodorus lived in the first century before Christ, and in the first six books, he describes the history of Egypt. I'm not clever, by the way, I can just read Wikipedia. And in one of the books, he describes the Egyptian statue of King Ramesses. Ozymandias is the Greek version of Ramesses. And the inscription says, King Ozymandias am I. If anyone to know how great I am and where I lie, let him undo me in my work. So using this phrase, they each wrote a poem. And in Shelley's poem, Diodorus becomes the traveller from an antique land. I suggest that Shelley's poem, Ozymandias, is a modern summary, a sonnet, of today's text. They offer the same message, that the greatest men, word used deliberately, the greatest kingdoms, the greatest empires fade into oblivion. Nothing is permanent. Shall we have a play and see if Ozymandias is indeed a modern interpretation of Mark 13, which is an apocalyptic text? Maybe we should try the microphone. Yeah, let's, let's see if it works. As Jesus was leaving the temple... I met a traveller from an antique land. 
One of his disciples said to him, who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Look, teacher. Near them, on the sand. What massive stones. Half sunk, a shattered visage lies. What magnificent buildings. Whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. Do you saw, see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Tell that it sculpt her well those passions read. Not one stone here will be left on another. Which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things will happen. And on, a, on the pedestal, these words appear. And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? My name is Ozymandias. Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. King of kings. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. Look on my works. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, ye mighty and despair, do not be alarmed. Nothing beside remains. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Round the decay of that colossal wreck. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Boundless and bare. There will be earthquakes in various places, and famines. The lone and level sands stretch far away. These are the beginning of birth pains. Thank you, Jane. So Mark 13 is apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic texts are a preacher's worst nightmare because they are hard to explain and distorted in a quagmire of Hollywood horrors, B-grade novels and fundamentalist interpretation. In simplest language, apocalyptic means uncovering or revealing or making clear. I have in, in mind those opening celebrations of a great artwork, whether it's a sculpture or a painting, and you pull down the sheet and the artwork is revealed. So that's what an apocalyptic literature is. It's a revealing, and it does make use of artwork and symbol to make its point. The most important thing I would like to tell you about apocalyptic literature is that it is not about some future date. So don't look at the things and decide that it's going to happen in the year 2050 or something like that. Apocalyptic literature is always about the here and now. So there's no future date for you to add to your Google calendar. The problem is that apocalyptic literature in the mouth of Jesus moves us out of our comfort zones and confronts us with reality by ripping the cataracts out of our eyes. Using apocalyptic language of destruction, there are now various aspects of raw reality that Jesus wants to remind us of. And his message in this apocalypse, as in the words of Shelley's Ozymandias, is that nothing is permanent, nothing lasts forever, only God is infinite. In the moment, everything can change. Like the disciples who were awed at the stable eternity of the temple, one of the greatest wonders of the world, the ancient world, we too might be awed by the beauty, by the eternity, and the stability of our temple churches. Temple churches such as St. Paul's, Washington National Cathedral, the Vatican in Rome, the Notre Dame, democracy, 
capitalist socialist economy, the use of coal as energy, private property, our memorials to war. Jesus says it will all be turned to rubble. Our empires will tumble, institutions will crumble, that which we think will last forever is as fragile as a soap bubble. You think civilization is making progress? Jesus says every single civilization will be thrown down. Just ask England, Greece. Who today could think that the Greeks were the world power of its time? Just ask Rome, Carthage, Persia. You think our research and technology will make the world a safer place? Jesus says that will be reduced to mere rubble. Just ask the inventors of asbestos, CFC and plastic. You think our creeds and faith will last infinitely? Jesus said those are man-made and not one stone will be left. Just ask the church in Ephesus, founded in 1 CE by Paul, destroyed in 262 by the Goths. To all the things we take for granted and assume will always be there, Jesus says they are all coming to an end. Or in Shelley's words to Ozymandias, nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. In short, Jesus says nothing around us is built to last, like the statue of Ozymandias and the temple in ancient Jerusalem, all will be brought down. Many of us here are already aware that life is fragile and cataclysmic destruction in some way awaits us all. We can rightly block our ears and shout back at Jesus I know the reality of earthquakes and famine and that life erupts and is left in rubble. Parents do not expect to bury their children. Yet the unexpected death of a much-loved child makes you feel that the walls of what you thought were your life tumble down stone after cataclysmic stone, leaving you shattered. People expect their health to flourish, but an unexpected illness comes like an earthquake and unsettles even the most stable of relationships. People expect to come home from a hard day of work and relax at home, perhaps with a zero alcohol beer in their right hand and watch some good rugby like when the South Africans beat the All Blacks. <laughs> Yet homes are destroyed in fire and flood, and they can destroy your sense of safety and belonging, like the temple was destroyed. People invest in growing their faith, but they learn the hard way that when something is gained, something is also lost. Deeper faith, more education, deeper prayer, growth in God, it does not come as cheerful progress, but rather like walls coming down as what you once believed in is ripped away by new experiences. Now, inability to let go is what will cause misery. I do love the poetry and breeze of good liturgy, and thanks to my regular attendance at a high Anglo-Catholic cathedral, many of the ancient collects contained in Cranmer's prayer book have been 
chanted into the permanent part of my memory. You could wake me up at two in the morning, slap me and throw cold water on me and I could just spit them out. Cranmo has that way. Unfortunately, while the poetic side of me is lulled into a trance by the beauty of his words, the questioning side of me raises an eyebrow. The evening collect is a good example. Be free to chant, should you wish. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the silent hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by... No good Anglicans here? The changes and chances of this fleeting world <laughs> may rest in your eternal changelessness through Jesus Christ our Lord. <laughs> Beautiful words, yeah? My experience of Jesus, however, is closer to that of Mark's in chapter 13. Jesus doesn't seem to answer my restlessness with rest, as the evening collect suggests. Jesus answers my, my requests for rest with more unrest. Wearied by the changes and chances of this fleeting world, Jesus' answer to prayer is not with changelessness, but ever more change. Jesus comes as a divine disruptor, not as eternal changelessness. And as Jesus once threw over the tables in the temple, he seems to have not given up the habit and overthrows the neatness of our ordered lives and ushers in holy chaos. Having Jesus in our life, to be honest, is downright inconvenient. From our perspective, the precariousness of life, the fragility of our institutions, which are crumbling around us even as we speak, the frangibility of relationships, and all we rely on seem like death. Yet with Jesus, these can be the birth pangs of new life. When our world is totally torn apart, when marriages end and people die and jobs come to an end, and it feels like the end, a new world is made available to us by God, and the pain of death becomes the labor of a new world. In God, every ending is a new beginning. And so in the apocalypse, Jesus asks us to accept with detachment the impermanence of life. Some say that accepting that nothing lasts forever gives us the, the urgency to embrace the present as the precious gift that it is. It's nothing like the news of a close one dying to remind you that the people around you and the present moment is a precious gift. To not leave undone the things that ought to be done. And in the words of our funeral liturgy, to use aright the time that is left to each of us. For others, accepting with detachment the impermanence of life inspires patient endurance in any nonviolent struggle against oppression. I suggest both perspectives are summed up in Edward Fitzgerald's fable, Solomon's Seal. So, a lot of English literature today. The fable goes like this. Solomon decided to humble Benaiah. He said to him, Benaiah, come here. There's a certain ring that I want you to bring to me. I wish to wear it for Sukkot, which gives you six months to find it. Sukkot is a Jewish fest festival of great happiness and lots of drinking. If it exists anywhere on earth, your majesty, replied Beniah, I will find it and bring it to you. But what makes this ring so special? It has magic powers, said King Solomon. If a happy man looks at it, he becomes sad. 
And if a sad man looks at it, he becomes happy. Solomon knew that no such ring existed in the world, but he wished to give his minister a lesson in humility. Benaiah had no idea where he was going to find such a ring. On the night before Sakkot, in absolute desperation, he decided to take a walk in one of the poorest quarters of Jerusalem. He passed a merchant who had begun to set up the day's wares on a shabby carpet. Have you by any chance heard of a magic ring that makes the happy wearer forget his joy and the broken-hearted wearer forget his sorrows? asked Benaiah. He watched the grandfather take a plain gold ring from the carpet and engrave something on it. When Benaiah read the words on the ring, his face broke out in a smile. That night, the entire city welcomed the holiday of Sakot with great festivity. Well, my friend, said King Solomon, have you found what I sent you after? To everyone's surprise, Benaiah held up the gold ring and declared, Here it is, your majesty. As soon as Solomon read the inscription, the smile vanished from his face. The jeweler had written three Hebrew letters on the gold band. Gimel, Zayin, Yud which began the words, Cham ze ya avor. This too shall pass. <laughs>